And welcome to the Metal Voice, Alan. Who do we got? We, we've got the Crowd very, we, we've got the very laid back, subdued, self-effacing, reserved frontman, a formerly of Twisted Sister, Mr. D. Snyder himself. Oh, hey, on hey, our don't metal. touch my balls! Don't touch my balls! <laughs> oh, thank you, boys. Thanks, thanks very hey, much. Hey, no, I, I'm just joking, man. This is we got the SMF himself. <laughs> Ready to launch his new album, Leave a Scar and Check Your Venereal Disease at the Door. We got D. <laughs> Snyder with us today. Oh, man. How's it, it's, how you doing, guys? Life is good. You know, after working in, you know, you work on a record. Okay, let me get start, jump right in here. Jump so right you get in. the idea to do a record and you're feeling some inspiration. You, everything starts with inspiration. You go, I got a great idea. So, and then you start working on it and now you're writing and you're working and everybody's like, oh, this is awesome. This is coming out amazing. This is incredible. Somewhere along the way, it changes to a question. Is this awesome? Is this amazing? <laughs> is it incredible? All self-doubt starts feeding in on and it's a creative process. You can't help it because when you've just been working in a closed, you know, at any time, you know, you're in, in a studio, but worse now during COVID, you're not getting any outside input. So finally people are hearing it. And the responses have been really good so far. Even after all these decades, you still have this self, self, self doubt when you're in the middle of the recording. That's process. a good point. Yeah, you know, it's 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 the truth. And, and anybody who tells you they don't is a liar. Wow. Any creative, any artist. Hey, you know what? Truth of the matter is, in all forms of work, we, we you know we, we whatever we're doing, there's comes times where we're wondering how it'll be received. You always think, oh, yeah. this is really good. This, this presentation's awesome. Is this presentation awesome? Like, you know, and so you finally <laughs> present it and go, oh, okay, yeah, it was awesome. Oh, I, man, they didn't like it. I thought it was really good. Uh, comedians, right? Oh, this is funny. My son was a comedian. He says, and you, you write a joke, you go, this is hysterical. And then you're reading it over and over and you start, is this hysterical? You know, you start questioning, is it actually funny? So uh, yeah, self-doubt's a normal thing, but the live stream event, the 29th is going to be amazing. I haven't done a show in almost two years and we're doing it. Everybody's tested or vaccinated and we're doing it full blown shoulder to shoulder. It's a small venue. It's about a thousand people, but it's going to be amazing to let the animals out of the cages uh, for <laughs> one night and a, a lot of new music from my new album stuff from my solo career. Uh, but then of course you can't, I can't, I, I don't want to not do twisted stuff. So, you know, so there'll be some good twisted stuff in there as well. There you go. These, you know, these got to rock again. He's got to rock again. I, I think what part of it. Yeah. I, I think what happens in any art, like you mentioned in comedy and music, you lose perspective when you're so close to something, you completely lose perspective. If something's good or not, such a great point that a lot of artists go through that. And I mean, sometimes it's the rise and that's the fall, right? It's, it's, you know, throughout your I mean, career, I'm sure yes, you had a lot of doubts. Exactly the case. It happens when you guys, you do a show and you go, wow, that was a great show. Yeah. And then, you know, then Five you don't clicks. know for sure until you play for the audience and they give you the <laughs> feedback and say, and then, wow, I thought they'd respond much better to that yeah. guest, but they didn't. Yeah. You know, I thought it was a great show. This is just, it's part of the process. Um, but it is, you know, it, 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 it does torture you and uh, keep you awake at night. And uh, so now that people are hearing stuff, hearing the first singles, Guys like you are getting to hear more of the record, starting to get feedback and responses, and I'm very happy with what I'm getting back so far. But, you know, yeah. for, for the love of metal, that made our top 10 the, the year that it came out. But it's like, you know, we always have to sell D. Snyder to the people. I don't understand. Like, how do you remain relevant to the younger crowds these days? Somebody said on one of the past interviews I just did, they said people are going, he's still around? <laughs> I'm like, oh, how many things do I need to do? Ouch. I that's act, cool. Everybody I we movies, interview, we get the same response. <laughs> I, 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 I've been on Broadway. I'm going, I'm it's still like, still get, I still get people coming to the street and go, D. Snyder, where you been? Oh, I'm like, wow. you know, but that speaks to the lack of ubiquity. There's a word for everybody. Ubiquity that we once had with things like MTV. Yeah. Where you couldn't get away from a rock band. I mean, you saw them on the side of buses, on billboards, on posters, on the walls, whether you were a fan or not, you, you were aware they existed. You know, when you guys do Broadway, well, if you're not going to Broadway, you don't know that these Snyder's on Broadway. If you're not in, a, I'm on 250 markets with my radio show, House of Hair, but if it's not in your market, you don't know I'm on the radio. So, you know, it's, it's, it's just, 
it's I'm not as ubiquitous as I once was. I, 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 I got to say something though. Yeah, go ahead. D, my wife is my gauge. If my wife knows someone's name or a band, then I go, wow, it's in the masses now, right? And right. So I go, do you know D Snyder? She goes, of course. Then we're not going to take it. Or or we saw you on Family Feud, right? Like, and there's another. How do you stay in the mainstream? But so many people watch that show, uh, yeah. Family Feud, and we kicked ass uh, on that show. But if you didn't watch, don't watch the show, like millions do. You don't what, know about what was it like? I'm just going off topic here. What was it like to be on Family Feud? Like we saw you on TV. Your family did great. You guys did amazing. You beat. Who are you going against? You're playing against Harry uh, Bradshaw and his the Bradshaw, Bradshaw. That's right. That's right. Former quarterback. Yeah, fa a Family Feud favorite. Yes, yes. Bradshaw. What was it like behind the scenes that you didn't see there? Well, I mean, you know, we were dealing with the COVID protocols, mm -hmm. which you know. Uh, and it was like even the audience, um, like the, the even the audience was socially distanced. They weren't like the normal audience, which which Steve Harvey, you could see he was missing that rapport with you get from a packed house. You don't get that ki yeah. kinetic. Is that the word I'm looking for? Energy when people yeah. are shoulder to shoulder, yes. laughter spreads, excitement spreads. When you force people to stay six rows apart and they're all over the place, it's it, people are less likely to laugh alone. You feel like an yeah, idiot. Yeah. A person who laughs alone is insane. Okay, a person <laughs> who laughs in a group is part of a, is, 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 is you know what I'm saying? He's sitting there laughing, <laughs> what's wrong with that guy? It, you know, but um, so there was all that stuff going on. But the thing, biggest thing for us was when I looked up to see who else had been on the show, they've never had a rock family let alone a heavy metal family oh, wow. on the Family Feud. And um, they've had uh, rap, they've had pop, they've had all those kind of things, never a rock family. So I felt a sudden responsibility and my family <laughs> I spoke about it said, look, let's not go out there and be clowns, even though it's fun to goof around, it, you know, because they're kind of, that's what they expect you to do. They don't mm -hmm. expect you to come in there and kick ass on the game, win $25,000 for the Coalition for Homeless Vets. They don't expect you to do that. So we we had a little talk backstage and said, let's represent our community like I did when I went to Washington. That's, that's what and I was going to say, yeah. expect me to be an idiot. And I said, I'm not <laughs> going to, I'm going to take this seriously. I'm not going to play into what they expect, their definition of a heavy metal rock star. And I'm going to stun them by actually being intelligent and thoughtful on the subject of censorship, which I did. Yeah, 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 yeah. Do you still carry the torch all these years later, raising the heavy metal flag on national TV? Yeah, you know, it, it, you know, it's funny. People ask me about censorship. And I said, first of all, from the when the first word was spoken, somebody was there said, you can't say that. Yeah. Okay, so censorship has been just a constant. Um, people, one side has wanted to stop people from speaking their minds or expressing themselves openly. And over time, we've, the creatives have pushed and pushed back and we've come further and further, but there's always been people who want to shut you down. The odd thing is that now it's swung the pendulum. It's coming more from the left than from the right. Mm. Before it was a puritanical right-wing conservative censorship. Now it's a, uh, you can't say that because it, it makes people feel bad about themselves and hurts their feelings and oh it's offensive and and i get all that stuff but it's gotten just like the other side got carried away this side's got carried away too yeah yeah you know okay you know what we're leaving out leave a scar okay I, the problem is when we have you on we just want to talk about everything yeah, you know? it's, it's, <laughs> howard stern once told me when i would we, i was on a show a lot i go dude you didn't talk about the album he goes believe me they know you got an album <laughs> let's just talk and then i'll tell them you got an album It'll be right there. we'll just plug you know? leave a scar you know every 10 minutes leave a scar july 30th on napalm records produced by uh, jamie jasta right i mean this yeah, guy's taking it to another level yeah of hate breed uh, yes yes yeah he's of hate breed he helped me find my way home so to speak yeah. in 95 after the second widowmaker record i kind of felt i had overstayed my welcome in the community uh, and uh, I also read some things that said, D. Snyder, you've overstayed your welcome. Did you just hold, what did you just hold up there? Widowmaker. The second Widowmaker. Widowmaker. There you go. Stand by for pain. Very heavy record. Heavy. But, um, 
So I stopped writing. I stopped creating at that point. Um, and went and got into radio, TV, movies, all these other things I've been doing. And then Twisted Sister reunited. But that was oldies, nothing new, nothing creative. And then a few years ago, Jamie Josta challenged me to do a metal record yeah. uh, on his podcast. I said, look, I love metal. I love contemporary metal. I just don't know where I fit. And Jamie said, I know exactly where you fit. And we went and did For the Love of Metal, which showed me and showed the world that there was a place for Dee Snyder in the metal scene. And when it came to doing this record, um, I immediately, first of all, for the first time ever, I went to the same producer for a second time. And I called Jamie. I said, I want to do a new record, but I need to be a part of the writing process. I'm ready to be a part of the writing process. And I've got things I got to say on this record. And uh, so that was, that was a big deal for me to come back after 25 years of relative silence, coming back and being involved in the writing, creating of this, of this album. Yeah. I, got, I got two questions concerning one of the songs, Crying for Your Life, okay? How many vocal takes did it take you to do that? Because it's as if you're 20 years old again, the power coming out of your vocals on that song brutal, is brutal. incredible. Thank you. The power of Dio compelled me. Uh, that one was <laughs> yeah, very yeah, Dio yeah. inspired. And when I heard, uh, when we started like working on it, I said, this is real dio -y. And I said, well, well, hell, you know, that's one of my influences. What a great <laughs> voice we've lost. And I'm going to give it my Dio best. And, uh, and that guy used to say could pierce chain mail with his voice. Uh, you know, <laughs> such a powerful, powerful singer. But yeah, most of those things, you know, to, to pull back the curtain and reveal that Oz is, is a man. Uh, but this is with everybody. Usually you do three, four, sometimes five takes on a song. And then you go through and you pick the best pieces and put them together. And it's not that they weren't powerful. It's that sometimes, you know, you're missing, you're, you, you, you break on a note, you sing a flat note, something like that. So you got it. You want it to be in tune. You don't want to, no one wants to hear a song that's, you know, live, you get away with a lot more because people are caught up in the moment. It doesn't have to be perfect. But on a record where all they're listening to is the music, you want it to be perfect. Yeah. You the, know, the lyrics from that, the second part of that question, you do the, you did the crime. Now you do the time. Is, is this written for John Schaefer? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe I don't mind going there. Uh, I mean, certainly he was the cherry on the the cherry on top of the cake. You know, it's like a an like a, like an argument. It's like this. He was like the straw that broke the camel's back. My observance, and by the way, you listeners, I'm not saying all of you. I'm not saying you know not everybody. This, but a lot of the younger generations. I'm a I'm a, you know I'm the I'm a boomer, and I take credit for spoiling the kids. Uh, but a lot of the younger generations, best mind, there's been a tendency to finger point and not want to take responsibility for your actions, especially when things go wildly wrong. Uh, and uh, I come from a generation, and that saying is from my, my wife's family's in the mob. And uh, they, you know, they would, you never snitch. You do the crime, you do the time. That was their saying. And, and uh, you know, snitches get stitches uh, <laughs> and things like that. But, um, but I just I said, that's, We've lost something here. You you know, you know, life isn't always perfect. Own your excrement. I don't know if we curse on your show or not, but own it. You know, when when I screwed up Twisted Sister, and I did, <laughs> it was me. I didn't point fingers at the other guys up band. And I and look, I could break it down and say, well, you know, that was because this and that was because that. End of the day, I was the problem. And I'm the reason it broke up. And I take I take full credit and full responsibility. And so many people around us go, well, that is an absolutely totally true. I said, listen, I'm not gonna sit there and nitpick. At the end of the day, if I wasn't there, it would have been a problem. Also, you know, it, take responsibility in general. Don't don't hand off blame, you know, be the boss. I'm the boss. Okay. So yeah, it's my fault. That's what happened. I also yeah. take credit for the good things. We sold 10 million records. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah. That, that, that's, that's what people leave out all the time is the good stuff, right? The, yeah. They always leave that part out. Don't leave me, a mark, leave a scar. We, we talked to so many people, D and, and the commonality, the people who've sold the bands or artists who have sold so many albums over the years. Did you find that you were, I wouldn't want to use the word cheated, but you were underpaid for all the albums and millions of albums that you sold over the years. Cause I mean, that's a common thing. I mean, we talk to artists after artists and they go their best selling album. They haven't received much money from. Okay. You ready? Yeah, I'm ready. First of all, yes. Okay. Twisted sister 
didn't start receiving any album sale royalties until we recorded uh, we recorded Heroes Are Hard to Find for the Strange Land soundtrack. And in order to get the band to reunite, the record label wiped our debt out. That was 1997. Wow. The band had been broken up for 10 years. We had sold tens of millions of records. We had not gotten one royalty check. We you're started. Still, you're you're still paying for all their dinners. dinners. That's what it was, right? Yeah, I'm at Aired again. Uh, somebody brought up to his attention that we were still in the red all these years later. And they were trying to get us together and said, Amit, would you please just wipe this guy's account clean? Haven't we got enough from them? Wow. And Amit Erdogan probably didn't even pay attention, know those things. He's the, he's the founder of Atlantic Records. He's passed. You know, he's the man. He's sort of the Clive Davis of Atlantic Records. Um, but he saw it and he said, they paid enough. And clear, the, and so we we've been getting royalty checks, oh, but the ones we should have gotten, those big ones, never got them. So, so now when we're talking about royalty, we're talking about, uh, you know, per album. We're talking about what mechanical. We're talking about like what kind of royalties? Like you had well, publishing, right? You, royalties. Songwriters get songwriter royalties, yeah. um, and uh, I was a songwriter. I got those. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Because and they are get, independent of the band and the record label. Because when you have an outside writer like Desmond Childs writing on a Bon Jovi record, he's not in the band. He's like, yeah. I wrote a song. So you, you cover a song by a classic rock artist. They don't want to hear the band still owes money for their recording sessions. They're yeah. like, give me my money. You know, yeah, yeah. Anne Warren, all these people that get paid. So I got paid, um, thankfully, for that. But then there's, um, but then there's the, the mechanical royalties are for record sales. Yeah. And so in 97, we started getting royalties. And by what? When did, when did Napster come out? 2001? Around there, So yeah. a few years later, people stopped buying records. Oh. <laughs> so, uh, so our royalty checks are our are, 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 are joke. Spotify. Spotify yeah. pays nothing. Nothing. Yeah. You know when that guy, the, the owner of Spotify, said write more, put out more albums? That was his solution to make more money. Yeah. Yeah, put out more albums, more cans of Coke. <laughs> put them out and sell more yeah. cans of Coke and you uh, get more money. Crazy. That's what I heard, like one thirty-second of a cent for every hit. Yeah, I remember it was uh, uh, um, that guy, Psy, whatever he was, it was Gangnam Style. He had like a billion plays on, was it YouTube or whatever was the format? And he got $35,000 oh. for a billion. Oh. <laughs> what do you get for a million then? Well, do the math. Yeah. And what do you get for a hundred? What do these young bands get when they we hit a hundred thousand? Here's your twenty five cents. Oh, it's slave no, labor. I, mean, I, mean, well, I does, won't it, say it that uh, that harsh, but it, it's basically using other people's intellectual property to profit. You know, yeah. that's that's what it is, right? Yeah, and and you know we could talk on that forever yeah, because yeah. you know the red company they shot themselves in the foot by being greedy. Uh, you know when they came out with the with the DVD the, the CDs and charge everybody a premium because it was a new technology. Yeah. And then, you know, 20 years later, they're still charging a premium for the new technology and it was costing <laughs> them less than a buck to make them. Yeah. yeah and then yeah. people finally said, you know what, you're ripping us off. But sadly, the artist got hurt yeah. while they were trying to punish the uh, record companies. Yeah. All right. Alan, back so, to the yeah, album. Yeah, back to the album. Hey, look, just the <laughs> in for the kill, okay? Is this a new life philosophy for you? I mean, that's, uh, you know, it's pretty pretty poignant lyrics to that one. You know, In For The Kill, which is a song about that moment in your life or moments, hopefully you have multiple, where you've prepared and you've gotten ready and you've rehearsed, you've practiced, you've worked, you've studied, and now's your shot. So, and it's a metaphor for that. But, and this speaks to the um, censorship that's in the ethos here that's around us. And I had a moment when I was writing those lyrics where a little voice in my head said, oh, wait a minute, I don't know if I could say that. And then the loud voice, we're not gonna take it for it, said, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> like screaming, I'm like, oh, okay, okay, okay. You know, but, and, but then I said, man, how sucky is that? Writers use metaphor. It's one of our tools for creativity, for, you know, and, and the fact that our writers are now questioning whether they can write a metaphor because someone might overreact or, you know, whether it's a person might, you know, pick up a gun 
because I wrote a gun metaphor yeah. uh, or proven that, you know, that's God, how rare is that? You know, that something like that happens. And by the way, for the record, you know, the only time the, the media ever brings up that a, murder, a killer listened to metal or hip hop is when they listen to metal or hip hop. We have no idea what Dahmer was listening to. Yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure it was Barry Manilow. Well, I mean, no Hitler was listening to Wagner, Vegas. right? <laughs> no idea what he listened to. Classical music, probably. But if it's Marilyn Manson, oh, heavy metal. Causes- no, but, but D, what they fail to say is that people have been killing people from the beginning of humanity. I mean, you know, yeah, before there was even to? heavy metal, right? What, what was Genghis Khan listening to? What was, what was Hitler was Hitler listening to listening classical, to? right? Yeah, so. right. Right. No, that's we never right. talk about that. Only if it's a hip hop, a gangster rap band or a metal band. So that's a BS. Yeah. 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 She. Is that about your wife? You know, I try. I, I got interviewed the other day and a guy said to me, is that about music? Is that that thing in your oh. life? that?" And I said, wow. I said that, you know, I love that you that you thought that uh, there's that famous song by Rod Stewart. You're in my heart. You're in my soul. You'll be my friend when I grow old. He's singing mm-hmm. about a soccer ball. He's singing about <laughs> soccer. He loves Wilson. <laughs> yeah, he's no, he's true. And if you see the video, he's kicking a soccer ball around. For him, soccer is his solace. It's that escape. It's that place he goes. And so she, I'm glad that somebody read something else into it because it's about my wife. And uh, you know, 45 years and counting. And um, you know, I wanted to write a heavy metal love song. I do write them from time to time, Hot Love and You're yeah. Not Alone and songs like that over the years. And I hadn't written anything in 25 years. So I felt it was, I was due. <laughs> Last time I wrote it, so we were 20, 20 years. So now we're 45 years. Okay, I got to write a song. I think it would, if today, if that was released in 1984, that would have been like a smash hit. You know, I, I don't know, I think that would a lot of rotation. Very melodic. And, and you know what, Alan, we should just talk about the album. Like my, my perspective on this album is like, it's, it's just unbelievable. It's unbelievable. It's, it's the album. It's probably one of your best albums. That's all I could say. Like, I mean, I, from a melody perspective, from a technical, from a production perspective, it's just, it hits all the marks. There really isn't any filler tracks. Thank you for saying that. I mean, cause you know, I'm not just saying that. No, and I, I and I appreciate it. My, my yeah. son, the filmmaker, he said, Dad, it's what they don't have to say. He says, yeah, when you can say a great new record, that's what they have to say. But when they go further <laughs> and they break it down, there's, there's truth in there. Because someone who didn't like it is not going to take the time to go, oh, no, but I really like the proficiency and the melodies were really, no, they're not wasting your time or theirs. <laughs> um, so, uh, no, I appreciate that because this is the things we were trying to do. We we're trying to create that that balanced record, I want to appeal to younger, newer fans, but I also don't want to completely leave behind my older fans. And I wanted that, you know, one thing I, I, I love about the newer music is that technical proficiency the guitar players have, that precise, yeah. tight picking. And the guitars, the guys are shredding. My band is shredding. I mean, just unbelievable solos. So we really were trying to, to, to ride that, that line. But now it's a point of interest to you. So I got a song on there where I have a death metal singer named Corpse Grinder. Yeah. That was my idea. Um, <laughs> and Jamie Johnson calls me OGD. He says, he's, because I'm always trying to push it harder and heavier. And he's a picture like rains on me. And Jamie, the hardcore guy's going, whoa, deep, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's not lose who you were. And it's not that I don't love my past and whatever, but I'm very excited by the new sounds and the new things and, and I love playing and experimenting with them. But as Jamie Jasta, who would I would keep saying, more green vocals, more hardcore vocals, and he'd go, eh, eh, we need <laughs> that, that's what music is missing right. today. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're, you're missing yeah. those Martin Birch pe- producers. You're missing people like Jamie who are sort of reeling you in and they have a vision as well on how to contain D Snyder or whoever they're talking about. Well, you know, he said from the very beginning, I, I said, I don't know where my place is in the contemporary metal community. And he said, I do. He had a very clear, not just a respect and appreciation for me. He feels that um, this is his words, not mine. And my voice is one of those voices yeah. that he feels should be in the that's pantheon. Sure. That's, you know, with Ozzy and Halford and Dio and all these great singers at Dee Snyder's voice is one of those voices. And he says, indeed, I saw you live. That was, his, that was his inspiration. We were on a festival together. And he's like, God, you're singing as strongly as you ever sang. He goes, it's not like you've lost it. And I said, and so he 
really guided me. And it's shocking, really, that this hardcore guy from this hardcore band who doesn't sing a melody in his songs um, is so involved in creating great melody with me and great uh, and great balanced songs that would be right for me, not for Jamie Josta. He's not trying to make a Josta record. He's trying to make a D. Snyder record. And and I love that, man. I, I mean, I just so appreciate it. I went back to, again, wasn't even a second thought. Jamie, I want to make another record. It was, yeah. you know, I didn't even think for a second, should I use someone else? No. I mean, the, for the love of metal, that was like angry, raw aggression. And this one's like more of a measured aggression, if I can call that, with the, with the lyrics are very focused and you have a message to tell, but you do it in a subtle and very melodic way. That's what I took away from this album. Well, it's, a, it's a, you know, it's about 11 songs. I pretty much bludgeon you for the first 11 with melody <laughs> and with, you know, with, uh, with, you know, with great, you know, playing and stuff like that. But the first 11 songs are unrelenting. And then all of a sudden I throw the brakes on and, and when you're punch drunk, I go, now that I have your attention, I'd like to talk to you for a second. And I finished the song Stand, which is a ballad, and I practically speak the first verse. Uh, so, you know, this was really planned out, but not in a contrived way, in a way that we hope will reach people the most. Always a pleasure, Dee, and uh, anxious to have you back and uh, see how this live stream goes. We got more to talk about. There's like All right, thanks, Dee. Take care, guys. Take care. Bye.